Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. Hi, this is Bill. I thought this interview was so good, I wanted you to hear it again. So enjoy. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold. You know, it is clear in God's Word that prayer is of the utmost importance. There's so many places in Scripture where we're not only commanded and encouraged to pray, especially by our Lord, but His apostles in the New Testament. In fact, the Apostle Paul exhorts us to pray without ceasing, to continue steadfastly in prayer, and to pray at all times. So from these commands, we can see that prayer is exceedingly important And because we are commanded and encouraged so often in this way in the Word of God, if we read the Word of God at all, we really have no excuse for failing to rightly estimate the place of prayer. Those are words from Jesse Hamilton, who's written this gem of a book on prayer called Prayer, the Church's Church's Greatest Need. Jesse's been involved in Christian ministry for more than 20 years. He's authored several books, and I'm awfully glad to have him back on the show. Jesse, welcome back. Thanks so much, Bill. It's great to be back. Yeah, and I read your book in one sitting, and I think that's what you had in mind. Uh, it's not a long book, but boy, is it packed full of great stuff. I read it in one sitting. I took all kinds of notes, and now a week later, I can't read my own handwriting, so I'm in, in a lot of trouble right now, Jesse, just so you know. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah. yeah. But I just want to start by... Um, I've got a lot of questions for you because I did underline a whole lot of things. Um, And you talk about prayer as the Bible speaks of it is truly powerful, genuine, biblically ordered prayer gains the attention of Almighty God and moves him to action, resulting in real changes in the world. That is so true. But how often do we remind ourselves of that? Right, right. Yeah. So I, I really... I really came to a conviction of the importance of prayer as a, as a young man. Um, and uh, I grew up uh, attending all night prayer meetings uh, that were wow. held in my parents' house. Yeah. My, my parent, my dad was a pastor and my mom and dad have been missionaries for 25 years now. Um, but yeah, one of my earliest memories is just, we were praying all the time. And uh, as I grew up and and learned more about the faith and and eventually came to my own uh, faith in Christ, um, you know, just searching the Bible and seeing how often prayer is mentioned and um, how we're exhorted to do it uh, without ceasing. Um, And so um, when you really, though, get into uh, the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, uh, you just see uh, people praying and God working in in response to those prayers. Uh, it's really from beginning to end uh, in the Bible. And so, yeah, we as modern Christians, um, there are just a multitude of reasons why uh, we don't pray. And I think we all can point to two or three uh, really quickly why we don't pray. But as you said, if we could just come uh, back to the simple reality that's displayed in the Bible, that if we commit ourselves to prayer, uh, the Lord will work in our lives and in the lives of others and in the church and in the world. I just think it would be revolutionary in in this day and age. I really do. Mm -hmm. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. Jesse, you did such a nice job of not only organizing your thoughts, but making them accessible and stacking stuff like uh, examples together, which, you know, for me, when I'm reading, I just go, this is great. Like when you talk about, consider the example of Moses, who in Deuteronomy 9 and 10, in reviewing the history of Israel to the people, plainly states God was ready to destroy them for their sin, and that it was only after his own prayers he brought before God for 40 days and nights without food or drink that God listened to him and was unwilling to destroy them. What manner of man was this that the Bible tells us that God listened to him and went from being ready to destroy the people of Israel to unwilling to do so? Mm, And then you stack this one on top of it. Then I'm going to let you talk, of course. 
You said the example of godly Joshua, who said in Joshua 10, spoke to the Lord and commanded the sun to stand still. The record goes on to tell there has been no day like it before or since when the Lord obeyed the voice of a man. Joshua 10, 14. Mm, yeah. So these are just really extraordinary examples. I love but, it. Yeah. But um, the really amazing thing, I think, in some of those uh, as as the verses say, is that God is listening to Moses and Joshua in, in that case, and he is he is basically doing what they're asking him to do. So I think the question for us is, um, how did they uh, get that to happen? What what's going on in their lives and in the relationship with the Lord to where um, they have that kind of access to him, that he listens to them, and that he actually responds to them. I think that, and, th and that's kind of what I try to get at in the book. What are sort of the foundational um, prerequisites or requirements, if you will, for praying in that kind of effective way? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, yeah, that's sort of, like I said, what I try to get at um, in the book. Yeah. Jesse, what does it mean to say that prayer is powerful? Yeah, so I in the book I just say that it it seems that prayer, uh, if it's done, if it's done in the right way, we can talk about that later. Let's do that. Uh, Make a note yeah, of that. Sure. Um it it and and you know, we say this, we have to say this in a very humble, of course, way, but it it gets God's attention or it gains his attention. And it is it is used uh, by God to uh, to move him to action. Really, I mean that if you're just reading the Bible in a in a basic, simple, surface way, um, these <clears throat> men would go to God. They would ask him something, and of course, they would ask him uh, in many cases repeatedly. And again, we could talk about that, but. Uh, God would listen to, th to them, and then he would uh, actually unleash his power according to what they're asking and uh, grant them their request. Um, so, you know, it's not, we could say that, um, you know, the power, of course, of prayer comes uh, from God in a sense, but prayer is effective at, uh, at really unleashing God's power. Mm -hmm. And I love these illustrations because Right out of God's word, we see the power of prayer evident in in the lives of of these uh, prayer requests. We see the prayers being answered. And yes, it, yeah. it it really makes me question and wonder why so few Christians pray. Why why so few pray as they should? When yes, yeah. I you know, and I spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the book, and then in a couple of my other books that I've written. I talk about that because I do think it's important for us to consider uh, where we are as a church, where we are in our individual Christian lives, and um, and then go to the Word of God and say, okay, are there any um, things that I need to be doing in order to be a more effective prayer? Now, obviously, the first thing we need to be doing more is is simply to pray. And I think for a lot of Christians, especially if you've grown up in a in a Christian home or have been in church for many years, uh, you know, you read the Bible on a daily basis, so you know how important prayer is. In that sense, or that case, uh, we need to just pray. We need, just need to set aside time to seek the Lord and to commit ourselves to, to pray. But um, for a lot of Christians, there is a little bit of a lack of understanding, I think, about um, the importance of prayer, the place of prayer, and then how to pray effectively. And so that's actually why I wrote this this little book. It was it was uh, it was actually a sermon that I preached when I returned for the first time from the mission field back in two thousand and three. Um, and you know, just just being involved in missions, even for a short time, it, it had just been four years. I came to realize how absolutely important prayer was in a in a fresh way but i also began to realize the importance of praying effectively uh how do we do that and so um like i said that's also what we talk about in the book well jesse let let's jump into that question when you say prayer needs to be done in the right way of course that can be intimidating because the, my first thought is have i been messing up all this time yeah 
So um, there's a couple ways really to approach this issue. One is to um, sort of think about Jesus and how he taught uh, his disciples to pray. Um, Jesus was very uh, interested in in prayer, obviously, but there were um, a lot of people in Jesus's day who were praying. And as we know, the, the, the leaders um, at the time were frequently praying and fasting and doing these things. And uh, Jesus was not happy or pleased with their prayers. Many of them were praying um, extraordinarily long prayers and somehow thinking that just by doing that, they were gaining God's favor. And so Jesus offers the model prayer as a way to counter that, what we sometimes call the Lord's Prayer. And so we can certainly start in terms of learning how to pray um, by looking at the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer and looking at how Jesus structured that prayer, uh, how, um, you know, the, the exact things in the prayer that he tells us to be praying for and that kind of thing. But but actually in the book, I approach this whole matter of praying effectively a little bit differently. Uh, in the book, I'm concerned especially with what it means to be an effective prayer on behalf of others or for the purposes of, of God. Mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes this is referred to as interceding. Um, and uh, the word inter interceding, uh, an English word, uh, is is it does have a word behind it in the Bible. It's used in the Bible. Um, and it's the whole idea of coming in between two parties and sort of uh, pleading with one party on behalf of the other. Uh, so we see Moses interceding on behalf of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. I think that intercession is really the kind of prayer that's featured most prominently in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. So, uh, and, and we see that not only in the Gospels, but later on, especially in the writings of Paul. So the question I'm dealing with in the book then is, if we want to be effective interceders um, on behalf of ourselves and our family members, but also, more importantly, on behalf of the church, and the purposes of God and people who need the gospel and all of that kind of thing, then then how do we do that? What's what do we need to have in our lives in order to be effective intercessors? Mm hmm. Jesse Hamilton. So, oh, yeah. sorry, Jesse. Sorry. Well, I just wanted to I'll let you finish your thought. I, I I'm sorry I cut you off. No, no, no. So I, I was going to say we can uh, we can go ahead and talk about that if you want. I if, do want to talk about that. OK. So um, the, the first one that I mentioned in the book is the whole idea of purity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this is something that is, um, you, we have to handle it carefully because, um, you know, the Bible is clear in many places that we can pray to God anytime. Um, and if we are humble and sincere in that prayer, he will hear us. Mm hmm uh, but when when it comes to being an effective interceder, the Bible also is clear in in many places that um, that you have to be a person who is walking in holiness to, as it were, get God's special attention. Um, I mean, if you start in the in the Old Testament. Um, you know, you have Psalm 24 where David says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart is the one who can ascend the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place. Um, you know, Proverbs 15 says it's the prayer of the upright that is acceptable to him. Um, you know, Isaiah talks about walking righteously and speaking uprightly, and only those people can dwell with the Lord. But in the New Testament, it's even more clear uh, in James 5, you know, it says the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Um, Paul tells Timothy that the men are to lift holy hands without anger or quarreling. Uh, Peter says, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way so that your prayers may not be hindered. So in in God's purposes, is this is kind of, and again, it's kind of hard to understand, but and there's a sense in which we need to be walking in holiness 
and battling against sin and uh, by the grace of God overcoming it, if we are going to be effective prayers and if our prayers are not going to be hindered. Um, so that if if we just stopped right there, um, that would be something for us to think about for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Jesse, yeah. Jesse, does mm-hmm. does God, um, is there a sliding scale for holiness or does God grade, uh, grade on a curve? Yeah, so I, yeah, I think if we look at the Bible, um, you know, it's clear that God's standard, um, of course, is part of who he is in his essence, and it does not change and it cannot change. Mm-hmm. I think on a practical level, um, and I, I say this carefully, you know, I, I do believe that God considers every person's situation where they are, how much grace and opportunity they've had in their lives. And and it may be that his uh, expectations for some Christians are different than others to whom much is given. The Bible tells us much will be required. But um, I think in terms of uh, as Christians thinking about how to honor God and please God and become more effective in our prayer lives, we have to be seeking after the standard of holiness in the Word of God, and we can't compromise that. Amen. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. His book is called Prayer, the Church's Greatest Great Need. And you can learn more about that book at graceandtruthbooks.com. That's the place to pick it up. It's a little bit sold out on Amazon, but graceandtruthbooks.com is where you can learn about that. We'll take a little break. If you have a question or comment for anything you've heard so far from Jesse, let me know, 877-933-2484, and I promise we'll be right back. How about make a wonderful commitment to yourself this year by reading through the Bible, maybe not even once, but maybe twice, Say things to yourself like, I am going to create a new habit that maybe I have not had in years, and I'm going to commit to it, and I'm going to stick with it. You've always said you wanted to, so how about make it this year where you do it, spending more time in God's Word, and you can do it, and we can help. So all you have to do is get your Bible in a year plan right now, and you can do that right over at myfaithradio.com. Hi, this is Bill. I thought this interview was so good, I wanted you to hear it again. I'm back with Jesse Hamilton. His book is Prayer, the Church's Great Need. And Jesse, we talked about purity, but I know we need to also pray with passion. And what does passion look like today in prayer? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think that is also something that's overlooked a little bit. Um, I think we've all had that experience where we try to pray and we just don't really have any heart for what we're praying for. Um, You know, we've been in prayer meetings where people seem to just be going through the motions. Uh, But it's interesting when you open the New Testament, you see this idea of passion um, featured prominently in the New Testament. And um, and, and it's kind of surprising. I mean, uh, James mentions in, in his uh, famous verse about Elijah that it is the uh, fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. Um, I think this idea of fervency has to do with an earnestness and a seriousness uh, and also uh, a degree of of intensity mm-hmm. and intense emotion um, that lets God know that your heart and your desires are in line with his. Um, You know, if if we know anything about God, uh, we know that uh, he is a God of absolutes. He is perfect in his being and in his person and what he um, uh, what he feels, if we can use biblical language, um, he feels to the utmost degree. And so um, we we need to uh, get our desires and our hearts in line with his. And that means that when we go to pray for something according to his will, we pray with a degree of seriousness and a, gr- a degree of passion and a degree of fervor that um, that, again, communicates that we're serious about that and that we feel that. Um, 
You know, uh, it's been mentioned by many authors, Christian authors over the years, how important our feelings and our affections and our emotions are. Those are incredibly important to God. And um, and so when we come to pray, we have to demonstrate um, that heart. Um, you know, we Paul talks about Epaphras. Um, there's there's this really beautiful verse where he says that Epaphras is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. And I think as well that has to do with his his passion and his uh, his desire that the thing that he is praying for be granted. Um, so I in the book, I say that I think the key for us as modern Christians um, and, and again, I, I studied um, theology and philosophy in graduate school. This is such an important principle, though, from the Bible that we all know. But but actions come out of our hearts and out of our desires. Um, you know, there's verses that speak about that. But um, we we need to get and, and this is our problem. We need to get our desires and our passions and our hearts aligned with the Lord's. Um, on a daily basis. In fact, I would say that might be one of the most fundamental things we have to do as Christians each and every day. And that's really the battle that we have in this modern world. Uh, one of the great hindrances to prayer is that there are so many things vying for our affections and that that can delight us, whether they be entertainments or pleasures or uh, just, you know, harmless uh, pastimes. Uh, leisure time. I mean, we live in a world of great temptation in terms of just things that we enjoy. And so we have to fight to have the passion for the things of God that he has. And then that has to be the thing that fuels our prayer. Uh, we have to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I I want this to happen because I know that you want this to happen. And my heart is beating, in a sense, in tune with yours, Lord. And I, I am pleading with you with passion and earnestness because I know that this is something at your heart, Lord. And I think that kind of praying is what, in the end, is going to be effective. Jesse, you say in your book, you refer to something Martin Luther said, where Luther said, prayer is not a collection of balanced phrases. Then you also quote English pastor Samuel Chadwick, who said, it is the pouring out of the soul. What if love, yeah. if it if it not be fiery? What are prayers if the heart be not ablaze? I love that. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful, beautiful quote. And and Samuel Chadwick was known for those kind of quotes. Um, and, you know, again, I just think I mean, and, and again, we've had a lot of pastors and a lot of Christian authors tell us these things, even in our own uh, times, in our own day and age. Uh, and I think if we would all look at ourselves and our lives, we have to acknowledge that this is the battle, the battleground uh not only in prayer, but just in honoring God is is the battleground for the affections. And so I think we could argue that if we don't have a heart for God and for his things and for his honor and for his glory and for his word, um, if it doesn't bother us when we see the world um, forsaking him and ignoring him and belittling him, if we don't care for the things that Jesus cared for, um, uh, those who are in need, those who have never heard the gospel, um, then we're not going to be praying for those things and we're not going to be effective prayers. So that, it, and this this is really at the heart of what it means to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It really is a battle for the affections. And when we come to God in prayer, I think as Jim Elliott, whom I quote in the book, um, said, I, I think if we come to, to the Lord in prayer and we don't have that kind of emotion and passion, I, I think we don't need to expect those prayers to be answered. Um, and so I think I would agree, I would agree with that. We need to, to come with a degree of earnestness and, and seriousness. Mm -hmm. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. Jesse, I have a question about sovereignty of God and prayer. And you talk about this in your book as well, that the Bible speaks of God's unchanging will which has been ordained from all of eternity. So it is indeed 
So is it indeed inappropriate to say we can change or influence the will of God? Well, that that of course is a is a complex topic that I know. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would take a lot to unpack. Uh, in the book, I I take this approach. Um, I, it's a little bit of a low level approach, but uh, I do think it's it makes sense uh, from my perspective as I read the Bible that God is sovereign and that His will um, is is fixed. Uh, he knows what's going to happen. He has ordained whatever whatsoever shall come to pass, as the Bible says. So that raises the question, then, then what about prayer? Um, well, I think that the easiest way to approach that is to understand that in God's purposes, which are fixed, he has uh, ordained or arranged or planned that people pray and that he is going to respond to those prayers. He's going to work and accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish as people are praying. So in a sense, the prayers are also part of the will of God. Now, of course, again, that opens up a lot of questions about uh, our responsibility and our our freedom and this kind of thing, which is, um, you know, a little bit complex probably for this uh, topic today. But I I think that um, if we if we understand uh, just on a simple level, that uh, it's God's will for us to pray. Um, it's God's will for us to pray as often as we can and in whatever manner the Bible tells us to pray. Then uh, when we do pray, that is also part of the uh, 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 purpose of God that he has uh, established and he has brought to pass. And and it's through that that he delights to act. You know, it's interesting because uh, the, the the great Methodist John Wesley who was uh, very much a person who believed in in a man's individual freedom and this kind of thing, he said, uh, he would say stuff like this, God does not do anything except by prayer, but he does everything with it. So really, you know, it, it really doesn't matter which side of the sort of free will, God sovereignty debate you fall uh, on. Um, you have to get to the place to accept the fact that God wants us to pray and he wants to do things uh, through prayer. And so however that works out, we need to get about the business of praying. All right. If you are just arriving home and you're going to get ready to step out of your car, thank you for listening to this portion of the show. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of Jesse Hamilton, you can go to the website, which is myfaithradio.com, and check out the podcast. It will be available tonight after the show. For the rest of you who can hang in there, please do. Uh, Jesse's book is called Prayer, The Church's Great Need. You can uh, learn more about that at graceandtruthbooks.com. When we come back, I want to ask Jesse about how important is persistence in prayer. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Bill. I thought this interview was so good, I wanted you to hear it again. So enjoy. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. What's for dinner? It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Well, I never get tired of talking about prayer, and I'm getting to do that today with author Jesse Hamilton. He's written several books. One... Um, is called How to Be a Christian, and one is called Discipleship and the Evangelical Church, but the one we're talking about today is called Prayer, the Church's Greatest Great Need. And Jesse, let's talk about persistence, because sometimes there's that, I prayed and nothing happened, and should I keep doing it, or I'm feeling discouraged? What would you say? Yeah, well, you know, Jesus has this uh, wonderful parable in Luke 18 about the widow who um, basically just keeps coming to a judge with the same request, and eventually the judge gives in. And uh, Jesus makes the simple point that if this unrighteous judge would eventually give in, how much more will your good Heavenly Father uh, give in, so to speak, to your persistent uh, prayers or requests? Um, what this tells me is that in the providence, in the in the workings of God, in the will of God, 
that um, when we persist in a request, it it has a greater chance of being answered. Um, now, I realize that that opens up a lot of questions in, in our minds. We do know uh, just from common sense, but also from the Word of God, that many times we can pray consistently and persistently for something, and God doesn't answer it. Uh, we also know why that might be. One of the reasons that might be, of course, is that what we are praying is not actually in accordance with the will of God. Um, it might be something that's, uh, as as James says, we're praying amiss because we're wanting uh, something uh, that God doesn't want us to have. We're praying according to our own pleasures and desires and not God's desires. So we have to put those uh, qualifiers on it. But still, uh, if we are praying um, a sincere prayer in accordance with the will of God, uh, with his revealed will, that is, with what the Bible says that is something we need to pray for, and if we persist in that prayer, and then I would add that if we pray uh, from a place of of purity, we're trying to walk with the Lord and we're praying with passion, then that will make our prayers more effective. Um, and in fact, um, Jesus ends the parable by basically saying, but when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And so the problem is, is that many of us do not have the faith that is necessary to persist in prayer. Um, but I would argue, and, and there's many Bible verses on this, that it's it's really here in this in this requirement that we continue to come and seek God, even when he doesn't answer, that God is is most glorified and um, and honored and, and that our faith is uh, put on display. And we know how important faith is. We know that the Lord often puts us in tests of faith. Uh, we know that he wants our faith to be purified and and uh, and strengthened. And so what we have to do, the challenge for us is to continue to come before the Lord with that request uh, until he makes it clear that either he's going to answer or he is not going to answer. And that does absolutely take faith. Mm -hmm. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. His book is called Prayer, The Church's Great Need. Jesse, let me ask you this question. Is it appropriate and necessary to pray for ourselves first and foremost. Yeah, so I, I'm, uh, you know, this is something that I think is very important to talk about today in 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 the church. <clears throat> one of the one of the great uh, issues that we have uh, in the church today, and and I mean, this is not, I mean, this is just you can you can go to church for a few weeks and see this is that prayer is not mentioned very much. And churches are not praying as much as they should, but also pastors are not exhorting people perhaps as often as they should about how important personal individual prayer is. And I think it is absolutely necessary and vital that we uh, that we pray for ourselves each and every day and that we cannot actually become effective prayers for others unless we are first praying ourselves. The reason for that is, is because not only is prayer important in intercession, praying for others, but prayer is the means by which we gain the Holy Spirit's power in our own souls. Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we are to pray um, in the Holy Spirit as one of the weapons of warfare that we are to wage in our daily battle. Um, and so, and, and he talks about the word of God and prayer as sort of the two key things that we have to have in our lives <clears throat> if we are to be successful on a daily basis, just to honor God and just to make it in this world and, and to do anything for the Lord. So absolutely, we have to come to understand as Christians that we cannot please God without his spirit helping us and assisting us and working in us those fruits of the Spirit that we need. And also, we cannot get those unless we consistently pray for them. So I, I would argue that individual prayer probably 
um, on a daily basis is something that is really an absolute necessity for Christians uh, that we just have to have. And then from that, I think we could say that we then need to expand our prayers for those close to us, those we love, and then also the purposes of God. But again, I think the key is to understand exactly how important God's power is in our lives. I think so many of us go day to day, and I do this, I mean, frequently, you know, we get up and and we're just exhausted. We're Let's say we're in the middle of the week and, and we've got so many things to do and we just rush out into the day forgetting to arm ourselves, forgetting mm-hmm. our weapons, forgetting to, to stop and to give God his place and to let his word speak into us and then to pray in the Holy Spirit that his power would be in us that his protection would be around us and that he would help us for specific things throughout the day. So absolutely, we've just got to come to a fresh awareness of how important that is each and every day. Yeah. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. His book is Prayer, The Church's Great Need. And I love uh, what Paul was, you know, his prayer for the Ephesians was that the father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having your having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know. I mean, it goes on and on, but I mean, there's something that is a prayer, a powerful prayer. How often do we pray that for ourselves? Yeah, absolutely. I I think if you actually get into uh, the prayers in the New Testament, you will see how prayer is really needed for for everything. I mean, you know, uh, Jesus tells us in the model prayer um, that we need to pray not to be led into temptation and to be protected from from evil. I mean, how often do we do we understand that that temptation and that the devil are are ready to trip us up and to get us? And so we need to be praying all the time. And then you know, he says, like you said in Ephesians, that beautiful prayer that you just mentioned. Really, that relates to having a an understanding of who God is of his will, and then that his word would become real in our minds and hearts. And it's also a prayer that we would have this uh, sort of heightened understanding of how much God loves us, and that we would, in a sense, uh, just reach a level to where we are walking, as it were, in the love of God. Um, I mean, just imagine going about your day full of the Holy Spirit with a constant awareness of how much God loves you and how much he has done for you and how the, the kind of power that that would bring. Um, in Colossians 1, Paul prays that uh, the Colossians would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. We need to be praying that for ourselves. Lord, help me to walk in a manner worthy of you. And so we could go on and on. Um, And that's why, you know, in the book, I talk about learning to model our prayers after the prayers that we find in the New Testament, Um, actually learning to pray the very phrases and sentences that we see in the New Testament, making those our own, the things that we pray for on a daily basis. I think it makes sense that we need to strive for that. Mm -hmm. The last four or five days, Jesse, I've not been praying to God. I've been pleading with God. Is it all right to plead? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it goes back to that earnestness. I think it goes back to that passion. But I also talk in the book about um, this sort of method that people in the Bible seem to be using of uh, pleading or even in a sense arguing with God, um, trying to bring things before the Lord that would motivate him. And, um, you know, so it, it's in a sense... Uh, it's a conversation with God, but it's also trying to get at the heart of what moves God. And so we see the old people in the Old Testament asking God to to act and to move because his glory is at stake or because his name is at stake or because his people whom he loves uh, need help and assistance or because the devil is winning. Uh, or because, you know, his church, the bride of Christ, is being attacked and these kind of things. So when we think about praying, we also have to think about bringing before the Lord these 
uh, these sort of arguments, if you will, and just really wrestling and mm-hmm. pleading and then holding on to those things and not letting go until we uh, see the Lord act. I mean, and that goes back to that persistence of persevering and being determined to see uh, the Lord act and and move and just holding on to that. So absolutely, I think pleading with God is something that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesse, I'm going to take a break because my next question I want to ask is, uh, what are most of the prayers in Scripture? What are they concerned with? So I'll give you uh, 90 seconds to to, uh, think about that answer. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. His book is called Prayer, The Church's Great Need. And you can access that book at graceandtruthbooks.com. Graceandtruthbooks.com. We'll be right back with Jesse. Hello, Cheerful Givers. It is always amazing that you live so intentionally and give so sacrificially and are so generous in all that you do whether it's financial gifts or it's your time and talents and resources God has given you, you are making an incredible difference for the kingdom. And kingdom advances through prayer and giving. And we don't want to have the year end without inviting you to uh, make that end-of-the-year tax-deductible gift to help support Faith Radio. Your gift right now will keep us spreading the good news in front of a lot of people. So thank you for giving by clicking the link in the show notes or giving at myfaithradio.com. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Bill. I thought this interview was so good, I wanted you to hear it again. So enjoy. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. His book is called Prayer, the Church's Great Need. And the question I posed, Jesse, before the break, you probably already remember because you got your answer ready to go, or is what are most of the prayers in the Bible concerned with? What are they concerned with? Yeah, so um, you know we've we've all been in in prayer meetings where we kind of get off and we pray for little things here and there, and and those are certainly important. Um, the Lord definitely cares about every need and 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 every problem that we have. But when you look at the New Testament, the most of the prayers that we have recorded there relate uh, directly to what we might call the purposes of God. Um, so what are the purposes or the desires of God? Well, there's a lot of them, but in the book, I just run through a few. I mean, the Lord commands us in Matthew 9 to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers mm-hmm. into his harvest. So first of all, we see that we're to pray earnestly again there. But Jesus is looking out on the fields that are ripe for harvest, and he's saying we need laborers. So we have to pray earnestly that the Lord raises up workers who are willing to go and to give their lives for the harvest. Um, uh, Another one is uh, Paul says uh, about uh, his fellow countrymen in Romans 10 that his heart's desire and prayer to God is that they be saved. So if we're praying in accordance with uh, Paul's heart, motivated by the Holy Spirit, we'll be praying that lost people will be saved. Um, We will have a real concern and compassion for lost people, and we will be praying for them. Um, As I say in the book, the more like Christ we become, the more we will feel compassion for the lost, and the more we will be driven to beseech God for their salvation. Um, If you move on in the book of Acts, chapter 4, we see the church of God pouring out their heart for the laborers that God has already sent for. They pray that the Lord would grant your servants to continue to speak the word with all boldness. In fact, Paul asked the church himself to pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. He says again in Colossians, please pray for me that I would make the gospel clear, which is how I ought to speak. He says again in a later verse, pray for us that God will open to us a door for the word. In yet another passage, he says, pray that the word of the Lord would speed ahead and be honored. So we see that 
It's it's very important to Paul and the mission of the church that the church learn to pray for the purposes of God in the gospel, and that means sending, raising up laborers, sending forth laborers, and then protection for those laborers, for opportunities for those laborers, for uh, the word of God to be made clear, for them to speak it in boldness, and those kinds of things. Those those kinds of prayers are so prominent in the New Testament that we really can't ignore it. So we have to be asking ourselves really consistently, is this what I am interested in? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it certainly, uh, we all know, like I said earlier, that the Lord cares for us to such a degree that we can bring any request before him. But I would argue that because Paul is exhorting the church in the Bible, to pray for these things, then we have got to begin to model our prayer lives after that. Now, there's many other things. He also, um, we see many examples in the in the New Testament of the church praying for those who have been put in prison, um, praying for those who are being persecuted. He he says we should pray that Christians would have peace. So certainly, we need to pray for all those things as well. But uh, I would argue again that the majority of prayers that we see either modeled or that we are commanded to have to do uh, with the purposes of God. And that really tells me that this is where God's heart is. And going back to what we talked about in the beginning, and this is sort of what the book is about, if we're going to get to that level of prayer where we are praying in accordance with the will of God, and we are useful, effective prayers, then we're going to get to that point where we're spending time in prayer on a consistent basis for these things. And and we're even going to be doing it in our own individual prayer lives, and we're going to be gathering together with other believers like we see modeled in the New Testament and praying for those things with other believers. Mm -hmm. Jesse Hamilton is my guest. Jesse, we just have a few minutes left. And a question came in and was wondering about intercessory prayer. Is there an example of prayer in the Bible that could be applied to praying for someone who's involved in very self-destructive behavior resulting in and hospitalization multiple times. What would you say oh. to that if that was a friend coming to you saying, Jesse, how would I pray for that? I would I would say that even though we don't have that specific example, obviously, in the Bible, because that's a that's a different kind of um thing that, that happens uh you know, I mean we don't have an example of it in the Bible. There are so many biblical principles and prayers in the Bible that really do relate to that. Uh, if this is a person who is not a believer, that we need to pour out our hearts for that person, that God would open their eyes, that he would open their hearts, that he would free them from the shackles of whatever it is that's binding them, that the hold of the devil would be loosened from that person, and that God would reveal himself to that person in Christ, that the Holy Spirit would invade that person's soul and would just release them into the kingdom of Christ. I mean, that something like that is, is I would say, at the forefront of what a biblical intercessor would be interested in praying for. Absolutely. I mean, just hearing you pr- pray that or just suggest that, Jesse, just mm-hmm. kind of lights me up. It's like, oh, let's let's pray. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what, that Amen. is just, you just be passionate and, and full of... Uh, uh, fervor. And that's, uh, was really in- inspiring just to say that's, that's the goal. That's, that's what you can do to help. Yeah. Well, the, your book is, uh, it is, I, I was able to read it in one sitting, uh, plus a full pot of coffee and multiple trips to the bathroom. It all happened in one day. It was, it was really a good read. And I'm, I'm, I'm already through my halfway through my second round with it. It's 79 pages. So it is a uh, full of, of rich, uh, material and great illustrations and and great inspiration that that often is what people need almost as much as anything is just the inspiration to continue to pray right that's right that, and we don't need to be discouraged bill you know i mean we could all say oh i'm failing in my prayer life or i let that person down but if we just begin to take as it were small steps 
individually and in groups and as churches and then try to build on that, I believe the Lord would really work in and through that. We need to encourage ourselves to start, but to start small and just believe the Lord to to work through that. Yeah. I remember remember when Jesus says, my, my house is to be called a house of prayer. Mm. Mm. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, if we're looking around, we we see that the church is not in many places devoted to prayer as it should be, as it once was. And this needs to be a burden of every Christian to say, hey, if we're not praying, is God really working in us? Is God really with us? And if not, we need to we need to start praying. Yeah. Jesse, thank you so much for taking time today. It's been a delight having you on again. Thank you for having me, Bill. You bet. Jesse Hamilton's been my guest. His book is called Prayer, The Church's Great Need. I encourage you to go check that out at graceandtruthbooks.com. That's our show for the day. Have a great night, and God bless. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.